okay uh, uh, so uh, uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, today the topic uh, is mri of the pituitary gland so as an endocrinologist uh, whenever we see a radiological report it's always written clinical radiological correlation is required and uh, we are the best people because we are uh, uh, we we do have the complete history hormonal profile and the images uh, to interpret so uh, and as a team our role becomes very important when it comes to radiology of pituitary gland and we should be knowing about it and uh, i've been told that this program is directed towards the students uh, who are doing a dm training program so i'll uh, take you uh, through some of the uh, cases which we have seen at km hospital and uh, how and uh, how we interpret it so as we all know uh, the pituitary uh, we have to see the images it is t1 t2 and t1 contrast these are the three basic images when it comes to pituitary uh, we all know how pituitary looks like how the stalk looks like how the contrast uptake is there and a posterior pituitary bright spot is there uh, just simple to remember the height in children is up to 6 mm males at 7 females 8 and in pregnancy it can be higher and the stalk is measured at the base uh, and then uh, it should be less than 3.5 mm uh, if it is thick it will be larger at the base and if it is tubular also it is a problem so we'll go through the cases so these are the three basic images and i know everyone knows that t2 is uh, csf bright and t1 dark correct and with the contrast images and the contrast should not be uh, it is a low contrast which is given otherwise a very a uh, pseudo hyper intense picture may come up so the pathologies can be divided into uh, hyperplasia malformations adenomas and the paracellular tumors uh, so when we'll start with the hyperplasias so in this image i have shown you images of five uh, different patients and most of them look like uh, hyperplasias but only two of them are actually hyperplastic uh, pituitary gland so uh, we have to differentiate the uh, hyperplasias from other etiologies as well as in young kid when the scan was done and the pituitary was plastic for a stature when it was uh, actually looking into this everything else was normal and he was on a lower centiles and uh, when we looked at the sphenoid sinus it is hyper pneumatized so hyper pneumatized sinus can give an apparently larger pituitary size so this is one of the reasons for hyperplasia like uh, look on a of a uh, pituitary uh, this case for a short stature when got evaluated an mri was done and you can see the hyperplastic pituitary this was an obvious case of hypothyroidism with a high tsh and for the academic interest we repeated an mri after thyroxine replacement and we can see the scan Uh, the hyperplastic gland completely resolving over a period of time so it's a case of thyroid hy thyrotroph hyperplasias similarly this lady of acromegaly with the gross gh values and the igf1 values and a prolactin value when an mri was done it looked like a non functioning adenoma and we have uh, she was posted for surgery anesthesia workup uh, x ray was done which found some nodule in the uh, right lung and then a ct scan was done for that and uh, it was a big bronchial carcinoid which we have not thought of but looking back at the mri it doesn't look like it could be a hyperplastic lesion uh, if we look at carefully and then the primary surgery was diverted to the bronchial carcinoid surgery and after the surgery of the primary which was a ghrh secreting bronchial carcinoid we can see the resolution uh, of the mass and the stock effect went down and the prolactin and uh the menses regularize in this uh, lady so this was a case of somatotroph hyperplasia over an adenoma similarly another lady a uh, 24 year old lady with uh, post delivery persistent amenorrhea and headache she was evaluated and she was diagnosed as a non functioning pituitary adenoma and she was referred to us for the anesthesia fitness uh at that time we recognized there is some pattern to it there is a preferential involvement of the thyroid and the cortisol axis and the t2 dark sign which was seen in this case was clenching of the diagnosis of lyh we thought of lyh then uh, 
and a, a pulse a steroid uh, was given to her and a surgery could have been uh, omitted and this was a case of lymphocytic hypophysitis which she responded uh, nicely to a steroid pulse therapy and it was a case of lymphocytic hypophysitis so this was again a nfpa like looking lesion but it was a lymphocytic hypophysitis which mimics like a hyperplasia uh this young man with a figure of 8 appearance we can see the t1 and the t2 uh, iso intense with some heterogeneity in the t2 and the contrast enhancement uh in the t1 contrast uh, there is involvement of the gonadotropin axis and this is a case of a non functioning pituitary adenoma with a classical figure of 8 appearance so uh, we have seen through uh, the various cases where which looks like hyperplasia but could be uh, hyperplasia actually or a apparent pneumatized sphenoid it could be infiltrative lesions of lymphocytic hypophysitis or a pituitary adenoma looking like a figure of it we sh it should be very important to differentiate the lymphocytic hypophysitis from nfpa because the treatment is very different so these two cases of lyh with a uh, lymphocytic infiltration uh, presenting with mass effect of diplopia and tosses in this lady and this lady had a paracellular infiltration but the classical cortisol and the thyroid axis involvement uh, gave us a clue that it could be lymphocytic hypophysitis and the treatment with steroid not only resolves the mass effect but causes recovery of the cortisol axis in uh, future so uh, and this is a recent uh, uh, publication we had uh, where we have shown that early steroid therapy pulse steroid therapy not only resolves the mass effect but again the importance is the right diagnosis if we would have diagnosed them in nfpa they would have undergone uh, surgery and then we would have got a histopathological diagnosis so composite clinical biochemical and radiological diagnosis of lyh is to be made and we should not have surprises at the uh, surgery hpr in these cases and diagnosing not only uh, uh, omits the surgery we can treat them with steroids with good response not only on the mass effects but also recovery of the hormonal axis in future uh, uh previously we have published our experience of lymphocytic hypophysitis of around 30 patients where they have homogeneous enhancement stock would be thick t2 dark sign is very convincing and specific in many of these cases but they may have all the unusual features of necrosis and paracellular extension which would be classically seen in a non functioning adenoma there may be a dural tail sign of classical of meningioma or tumors so and a figure of eight of uh, nfpa so there will be typical and atypical signs but the clinical radiological correlation helps and that's why we have this radiological score called gutenberg score where there are certain points which favors lyh gets a minus points and there are certain points which favor adenoma gets positive points and if you get a negative score it is more in favor of a lyh but what we add to it is a pattern of the hormonal involvement uh, also help us to diagnose lyh then radiological classification of lyh is also done if the inflammation is restricted to the adenohypophysis or infundibulo hypophysis or both so in this case when it is uh, anterior hypophysis is involved we get a classical uh, thyroid and cortisol involvement when you have this v shaped infundibular thickness uh, we have a classical uh, di growth and gonadotropin involvement and it can be a mixed picture in pan hypo physitis so radiological correlation radiological diagnosis and then from radiology it can be predicted which axis and which hormone involvement would be preferential in these cases just uh, we have seen the cases of anterior hypophysitis before this is one case to show you a case of posterior or infundibulo hypophysitis presenting with gonadotropin di and growth hormone axis involvement there was a diffuse goiter also which FNS is suggested a Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So this is a case of infundibulo neurohypophysitis, preferentially uh, involving the gonadotropin and the growth axis, as shown in this case. Moving from hyperplasias to adenomas, so we have functional adenomas which are GH secreting. So acromegaly mainly we have macro tumors like as shown in this picture, uh, but it can be a micro adenoma, this small one. it can be a uh, varied side of macro adenomas can be seen this is uh, engulfing the cavernous sinus completely this is one going up usually growth hormones are down growing tumors growth hormone secreting but they can be uh, this like this one uh, 
and the T2 dark signal as shown below can vary. Usually they are T2 hypo intense and that correlates with the drug therapy, but they may be hyper intense as shown in this patient number three. Again, going ahead in acromegaly, we can get uh, surprises like empty cella and as in these uh, two brothers with AIP deletion in the case of familial uh, acromegaly syndrome. And this is like a burnt out acro and there is small tissue of uh, adenoma in the periphery, which is still making uh, the growth hormone uh, there. Uh, this is another interesting case uh, I would like to share where the pituitary was shown separate, but there was a supracellular mass. And this turned out to be a granular cell tumor. And so there is a paracrine GHRH action uh, is described in these cases, which leads to uh, growth access. Uh, another interesting case uh, where there was uh, involvement of the sphenoid sinus and mass was localized to the sphenoid sinus and a CT scan showed there is no breach. Uh, in the cellar flow. So this is, uh, we consider as a case of ectopic pituitary adenoma coming from a sphenoid sinus pituitary rest, uh, which have turned into an adenomatous transformation. So these were just examples of variations we have seen with acromegaly. Uh, going to Cushing's disease, it's classically uh, micro or what they say, pico adenoma. Most of the time they're not seen. Uh, they can be very small and we need a dynamic contrast uh, to localize these lesions. Uh, this is again a microadenoma. Uh, this is easy with a macroadenoma as a diagnosis. This lady has a cavernous extension and an apoplexy presenting with tosses. And similarly, this lady was a case of pituitary carcinoma with, with a large macroadenoma in a Cushing's disease with metastasis to uh, liver. So just to show the uh, spectrum of uh, uh, MRI findings of the pituitary in cases of Cushing's disease. Uh, this lady, uh, post bilateral adrenal surgery, this was a microadenoma, which turns a cavernous adenoma, which keeps on growing and the ACTH values went high and has to be managed. So this is a case of Nelson syndrome. Uh, this childhood case of Cushing's, this was uh, important to understand the uh, MRI because the whole the tumor is directed around the uh, internal cavernous part of the carotid art, uh, carotid. So uh, here we decided to, because the surgeon said this part is very difficult and to get through a safe surgery in this area will be very difficult. And this uh, boy was subjected to a primary radiotherapy and which he has responded very well. Uh, for the students to understand the cavernous sinus invasion, they say that if you're crossing the central line, uh, laterally, it is likely that cavernous sinus invasion is there. Another criteria is 67% of this uh, circumference is more than 67% is involved as cavernous sinus involvement. And usually normal pituitary go on the superior side, but if you're getting an inferior invasion, it is likely to be a cavernous sinus uh, invasion. Uh, dynamic contrast uh, is required uh, in so there is a differential contrast enhancement of the normal and the abnormal at 30 seconds normal pituitary will enhance but uh, then uh, as later the more uh, the, para, part, uh, the the lateral part of the pituitary will enhance later and the adenoma is last to enhance so the differential enhancement is used in dynamic sequences so for a pushing uh, micro adenoma dynamic sequences are required and uh, in our experience, we have added a wipe sequence or what is SPGR sequence uh, to this. And uh, the sensitivity of wipe sequence is higher than the dynamic contrast in our experience. And so this wipe sequence is also added at the end of the contrast sequence to localize it, but you can get false positive. So it has to be used judiciously and uh, proto protocol has to be well-defined when we are doing a scan for a Cushing's disease patient. Uh, moving from pro to the prolactinoma, prolactinoma when it comes to microadenoma, they are T2 hyper intense, uh, but localizing a microadenoma is not important because treatment is most of the time directed towards the drug. We have to rule out other sensitive pathology and or it is directed to look at a macroadenoma like this. Uh, at times they can be cystic uh, tumors as you can see uh, dark on T1 and bright on T2. And it can be a giant prolactinoma, as in this guy with MEN1 syndrome, the tumor was extending into the orbit and he presented with uh, proptosis. So giant tumors are more common in males, uh, but it do happens in females as well, and it can extend in all the directions. 
So that is one part of prolactinoma diagnosis. Uh, second, the response also uh, to the cabergulin, which is the primary modality of treatment in them, is defined based on the MRI, either through volume reduction by 50% or the dimension reductions by 30%. And uh, all of you would have seen uh, this large uh, uh, prolactinoma tumors melting away completely with cabergulin. At times, there is a partial response where there is a risk and there may be discordant response uh, also. But there are certain uh, resistant cases where there's no response and tumor keep growing and there are aggressive tumors uh, as well in this regard. Uh, rare examples of non-functioning pituitary adenoma. This is a shoma, which is like a classical macro adenoma and a gonadotropinoma. Uh, gonadotropinomas can uh, present with uh, multicystic ovaries in females or uh, high testo in males or precocious puberty in child. And they can have a classical presentation, again, like any other non-functioning adenoma. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, largest NFPA, which we ha I have encountered. Uh, so uh, usually NFPA grow upwards and the acro grows downwards. And so they are very, uh, so these can be taken. But even with the transplant surgeries, uh, our surgeon does a good job and these tumors can be uh, taken care of. Another character of the tumor uh, pituitary adenoma is the bleed. And when it comes to bleed, uh, specifically for the students, they should remember if it is T1 bright and a fluid level. T1 bright and a fluid level suggest a bleed. Though in an acute bleed, it may not be apparent. That is a classical apoplexy, but there will be a sphenoid mucosal thickness. So in such a case, usually the report is there is a sphenoid sinusitis and there is a sterile abscess. This kind of reports you will get in case of pituitary apoplexy when it comes from radiology at times when they don't know the clinical background. As the apoplexy evolves, the diagnosis becomes easy because uh, T1 and T2 hyperintensity comes in. And in cases of chronic hemorrhage, you will see a T1 hyperintensity with a fluid uh, level. Second character of a tumor is they undergo cystic degeneration over a period of time. And that can be recognized best in the T2 images. As you can see in various uh, tumors uh, of varied etiologies, functional and non-functional. So these are the micro multi-cystic, um, micro multi-cystic pattern, which is seen in T2. There the cyst size are bigger, but they are multiple. Here they have all collased and become a one cystic appearance. Here a part of the tumor, the superior part of the tumor is cystic. Here the central part is cystic. And in the last case, most of the tumor has become cystic. So this is a classical T2 cystic appearance of a uh, tumor, which these tumors goes undergo cystic degeneration. And the countering image on the T1 will be a mirror image of it. And there will be a hypo enhancing on the contrast uh, images. So coming from the cystic degeneration, we are going towards the cystic lesions in the pituitary. And the classic cystic lesion is a Rathke cyst. And the location uh, in between the interior and the posterior pituitary is the most important. If the cyst is filled more with the fluid, it will be T2 hyper intense and the T2 hypo intense and a non-contrast enhancing. Uh, size, don't go by the size. They can be deceptive. They can be very big RCCs as well. As seen in, they can be as large as this. And the small ones can have high protein uh, like material and then they can be T1 dark and a T2 uh, mirror image uh, can be there. Differentials of Rathke cyst could be an arachnoid cyst where a flare image is required uh, to show that this is a CSF. And uh, so a flare image can diagnose a case of arachnoid uh, cyst. Sometimes a sterile abscess can also present like hyper and hypo presentation. Uh, and it becomes difficult to differentiate and you get a diagnosis sometimes after the uh, surgery. But the ring enhancement, it can be an infective RCC or a sterile abscess uh, then. Uh, going from RCC, the next differential comes in our mind with a cystic lesion is a craniopharyngioma, which uh, are both uh, hyper intense on T1 and T2. And there will be a partial contrast enhancement if they have solid component. Uh, so cranios, even if we look at MRIs, we know these looks like cranio and the differentials can be, this is like a dermoid cyst, which is fat, which is also hyper and hyper uh, intense on T1 and T2, but you can see these uh, rupture dermoid cyst and there are 
so this this is a ruptured dermoid cyst showing a fat uh, which has uh, moved away in the meninges and uh, this is another example of hyper and hyper this looks like a cranio but the, uh, the, there was a normal pituitary behind in this image and the whole clinical picture was looking like an adenoma and it was a case and hpr turned out to be an adenoma it was in subacute bleed which was looking hyper and hyper in these images so these all images can be deceptive we have to clinically hormonally correlate how they are behaving uh, this was another case uh, of headache and uh, hemiplegia which presented with a cellar mass and uh, it looked very unusual and when we went and discussed with the radiologist they say it has t2 uh, flow void images and it turned out to be a uh, uh, aneurysm of one of the vessels and uh, we were very thankful to the radiologist to make this right diagnosis because if this patient would have undergone surgery it would have been a, uh, a very difficult uh, on ot table uh, just uh, in the last few minutes i will try to cover the non pituitary adenoma uh, so they are not primarily from the anterior pituitary uh, this is just few examples and some uh, unusual cases which we recently published last year also i've taken these images from that and this is a granular cell tumor which is like an adenoma but they say origin is from the posterior pituitary nerve sheath cells uh, brain tumors gliomas and astrocytomas are very common but only intracellular astrocytoma presenting with bleed uh, it was an histopathological diagnosis only we didn't suspected before uh, the hpr diagnosis came through then the surrounding areas like there are nerves there is bone uh, there are meninges they can have tumors from that so this is a case of peripheral nerve sheath tumors again it's a very rare entity but it was hyper enhancing on uh, t2 and contrast enhancing as well similarly the meningiomas are hyper intense on t2 and hyper enhancing uh, lesions with dural tail signs and rarely we can have a chordoma in this case and the origin was from the clavicular uh, area so whenever we see they doesn't look like our classical as an endocrinologist whenever i look at these images uh, they doesn't look like classical uh, pituitary adenomas and and the and the hormonal profile is not behaving the way it should behave in an adenoma there it raises a suspicion and it's, it's discussed in the tumor board and the radiologist would relate to these tumor better than uh, us and then we leave it to their judgment and the final answer comes through pathology uh, malformations uh, rcc as we have discussed before but there are certain other malformations especially in the pediatric endocrinology i would like to highlight again uh so this is a classical triad we say hypoplastic pituitary uh ectopic posterior pituitary and absent pituitary stalk so what we have learned from the latest Im imaging techniques the stalk is actually not absent it is actually thin and when you do a t2 uh, cis images uh then you can see the stalk and so the stalk is very thin in these cases so many a times if you carefully look at the stalk uh, the stalk will be very thin it could be seen on a contrast enhanced images or the cis images so this is we should order in a case of epp a cis image should be ordered to look for the thin stalk epp and hypoplastic pituitary will be uh, obvious Uh, sometimes when we are evaluating a short stature we do get surprises like it turns out to be a supracellular uh, tumors like optic glioma in this case or a germinoma in the another girl child uh, so when uh, the mri findings correlates with the hormones if you have abnormalities on the mri like the epp and the stock abnormality it likelihood of cphd is higher Uh, that is combined pituitary hormone deficiency and the severity of ghd is also higher in our experience and recently last year what when we have uh, uh, assessed the mutation positive in the isolated ghd cohort those cases who had hypoplastic pituitary the with as against those who didn't had hypoplastic pituitary the likelihood of mutation positivity was higher so it was a predictor for mutation positivity in a case of ighd cohort as well uh, moving to mri in delayed puberty again uh, hyposmia and the kalman syndrome is classical 
this is the image where you have to look for the olfactory bulb the dark black ones and the depth of the olfactory sulcus and there is another cut in which the length of the olfactory sulcus is looked for and so you have uh, so we look at these three things when it comes to uh, mri in a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and we try to classify them as uh, hyposmic and normosmic and it do correlate with their objective olfaction score and the olfactory bulb volume also correlates with the uh, objective volume uh, olfactory evaluation by upsit uh, again when we evaluate a delayed puberty we do get surprises as in this case it turned out to be a supracellular pilocytic astrocytoma uh, this boy with a delayed puberty had t2 dark uh, ring enhancing lesions uh and t1 dark lesion so that was a, a t2 dark ring enhancing lesions with a t2 dark and ring enhancing lesions and it was suspected to be tuberculosis and it was calcified calcification was proven so these are old uh, tubercular changes in this young boy it turned out to be a t1 dark and a t1 bright and t2 dark supra uh, cellular lesions and the radiologist have reported it as a teratoma in this case uh this girl with a supracellular lesion usually in fundibulo hypophysitis they are lean but this was uh, pretty fat in this case and the etiology turned out to be langeren cell his histocytosis when there was a lytic lesion in the iliac bone which was biopsy turned out to be lch uh last two slides on precocious puberty we know the classical site of hypothalamic hamartoma in a central precocious puberty but most sometimes we can have a larger hypothalamic hamartoma with elastic seizures and where uh, the neuro, the treatment may be directed towards surgeries but that decision we leave it to the neurologist uh, uh, this interesting case of uh, central precocious puberty was diagnosed in the fetal sonogram in the third trimester where they found the third ventricle was dilated in a usg and a fetal U mri was done and then after 6 months of life still he had persistent testosterone value and an mri was done was a solid cystic malformative lesions uh, could be seen so this is one of the youngest case of central precocious puberty with the malformation uh, we have reported uh, we can get an optic nerve glioma with mixed densities uh, it can be a pineal germinoma a germinoma classically should have double uh, areas of involvement so i think i've tried to cover in last 30 minutes all the various form of pituitary pathologies what we have encountered and managed and our outlook towards it and i would like to thank everyone for the patient hearing and i have learned all this in our tumor board meeting where i would like to thank our radiologist dr shilpa uh, nalini sha ma'am uh, dr rakesh jalali from tmh uh, radiotherapy team and uh, dr atul goel our neurosurgeon and uh, all my seniors and colleagues in the department i would like to thank them okay. thank the audience for the